Okay, welcome back. Um, topic 13 and today's subtopic, this is uh, the respiratory and circulatory systems. In 13.1, we talked about how muscles contract and the source of energy for that contraction uh, comes from aerobic or anaerobic metabolism. At least in the case of aerobic metabolism, that depends on delivering oxygen to the cells in the tissues all the way out to our extremities. Uh, and the way that happens is our respiratory system is the gas exchanger, oxygen and, and carbon dioxide, and the circulatory system is the delivery of oxygen to the tissues. All right. Uh, all right, so first uh, talking about our respiratory system. So uh, uh, this is probably not news to you, but uh, we breathe air on earth um, and, What's interesting about that air is the oxygen content. Uh, nitrogen being most of the atmosphere is an inert gas, but if you look at the inhalation exhalation patterns here, there's no absorption at all of uh, nitrogen. We absorb about 5% of oxygen and we exhale about you know this, this much, 4.3% uh, carbon dioxide. Okay, and uh, we'll talk uh, a little bit more about the role of each of these in the quantities. Actually, maybe that's coming soon. All right, so um, quantities, right, of oxygen. Um, we start with, we know each liter of air is about 21% oxygen. Um, and that's what we're interested in as far as once we have a certain amount of oxygen, we know how much aerobic metabolism can be supported. Um, so the total volume of, at least for an adult male, it's a little bit smaller for females, uh, of our lung capacity is six liters. So like three two liter bottles of Mountain Dew. Um, uh, however, so that's the total volume. However, with each breath, they don't completely deflate and reinflate. They're more you know, partial deflation. Uh, and so the amount of air exchanged uh, is usually on the order for, for, for a, at rest breath, it's only half of a liter. So right now I'm only exchanging half of a liter of air with each breath. If I was exercising and I'm taking deeper breaths, it's up to about two liters of air exchanged. Uh, now we're interested in, you know, per breath, we know the volume, and now we wanna know per unit time, or really, you know, in one minute, how much oxygen is absorbed, exchanged at the lung. So if you can assume, you know, go back here, 5% of the oxygen in the atmosphere is absorbed per breath. That's a rough average, of course. Then we know the volume of air uh, and we know the volume, you know, that's absorbed, you know, from that. And now we know how many breaths per minute. Now we can look at, you know, per unit time, how much oxygen, the rate of oxygen availability that's there for aerobic metabolism. So uh, our, we talk about our minute ventilation and it is you know, the tidal volume, again, which again, that's a good buzzword to know, tidal volume, the amount of air exchanged per breath uh, and the number of those in one minute, you know, in terms of the breaths per minute, uh, we, we see essentially how much oxygen is coming in to the, to the body per minute. Um, so what happens is as the, you know, humans go from uh, at rest to light work, one of the first thing that happens is they take deeper breaths, but they still breathe at about the same rate of about 10 to 15 breaths per minute. And then as I need more and more oxygen, as I'm speeding up and I'm I'm requiring you know, higher levels of uh, energy uh, uh, per unit time for my work output, uh, then I'm increasing my breathing rate. So if I'm working as hard as I can, I'm both taking deep breaths and breathing quickly, and each breath is a new dose of oxygen uh, for, that, for that metabolism. All right, so here's uh, some more math now. And, and this is the kind of thing that can be studied in a laboratory context with, sorry, um, with um, this sort of, sorry, I'm trying to move my camera, with this uh, oxygen mask sort of setup. So you can measure the inhaled and exhaled, you know, the content of the gases there. Um, so if we know, 
uh, let's say what, you know, one liter of pure oxygen translates, you know, in terms of aerobic, um, aerobic uh, metabolism, it, it translates to five kilocalories uh, of, of energy. Okay, so just believe me for that much so far. Now, here we go. So air is 21% oxygen. If we're at sea level, this can obviously be different. So if you've ever, you know, gone uh, to a higher altitude, climbed mountains where the uh, oxygen content is thinner, um, then you may have found yourself having to take more breaths in order to get the amount of oxygen that you needed for you know, your usual activities, hiking or whatever. Um, all right, so, but if we're at sea level, we got 21% oxygen. So one liter of air is 0 0.21 liters of pure oxygen, okay? Uh, now, if we take our deepest breath and we're adults, uh, adult males or, or close with adult females, about two liters uh, of, of air are exchanged. And if we take two liters times, you know, 0.21 per liter, uh, we now have 0 0.42 liters uh, in terms of volume of pure oxygen. Uh, let's say we take in 45 breaths a minute because I'm running as fast as I can. I'm, I'm at my peak, uh, deepest breath and fastest breathing rate. Um, now we multiply that by the oxygen content that we're absorbing per breath. Uh, now we're looking at about 19 liters per minute of pure oxygen that's available to my lungs. Now only 5% of that is absorbed. That's, you know, just by nature, our, our lungs aren't perfectly, you know, um, efficient, uh, but a pretty good average is 5% of you know, the oxygen content in pure oxygen uh, is, is absorbed per breath. Uh, and so uh, what do we get here? Uh, you know, what gets into the bloodstream is about 0 0.95 liters per minute. Now take that and go back to our original association of five kilocalories per liter of oxygen multiplied by 0 0.95 liters of oxygen per minute. And there is an interesting energy requirement rate, 4.7 kilocalories per minute. Think of this as the maximum amount of energy that can be provided by aerobic metabolism because you can't breathe any faster or deeper. Okay, so we're at our maximum <laughs> breathing deeply and quickly. Our maximum ability to replenish with oxygen, to replenish our adenosine triphosphate 4.7 kilocalories per minute. If I'm doing an activity that requires more energy than this, I am certain, or at least if, if these numbers are certain, I'm estimating for the most sense, but if I'm above 4.7 kilocalories a minute, that's when I know I'm gonna need anaerobic metabol metabolic sources. All right, so 4.7, here's how we got it. And now that becomes our magic number. And so let's say, all right, we, are we doing activities that are below uh, uh, 4.7 kilocalories per minute? If so, I bet the person can keep going, you know, for eight hours uh, per shift with relatively little, you know, like, you know, like uh, serious health issues or, or risks of injury. If we are doing work that's above that, we can count on anaerobic met metabolic processes we can count on lactic acid, sore muscles, increased risk of injury, fatigue, unhappy workers, you know, et cetera. So, you know, if we wanna measure the uh, required um, uh, caloric output, uh, you know, for certain activities, we can, you know, we can make this our comparative point, 4.7 kilocalories per minute. All right, so how does this compare right now? I'm probably a little bit more than 1.6 kilocalories per minute, but you, assuming you're sitting to watch this video, you're probably a little more than 1.6 because you're also thinking hard and listening. Um, but, uh, you know, at rest here, uh, if I stand up, I, I think I remember, I hope so, uh, in topic 12, I mentioned that the difference between standing desks and sitting desks, standing versus sitting, you burn about 40% more calories. This is about 40% more. Um, so, you know, you could think it's not exactly, but yeah, there you go. So from sitting to standing, 
All right, well, if I'm just kind of pacing around walking, 2.8 kilocalories a minute, but if I'm power walking, so I've got a range here, I might be above that 5.2 kilocalories per minute. And so I've got a transition point here, right? And to me, this is, I never really worked it out quite, but I know that when I go and I do gym workout, there are uh, settings on the treadmill where I know with that speed, I'm gonna be breathing, you know, I'm gonna be breathing at a, at, a, at a certain rate, but I can go forever. You know, like, yeah, eventually I get tired, but it's not like I feel like I need to stop. I can keep going, keep going. And if you know any, any sort of activity level, you can find a pace where you can just kind of keep going. And if you push it a little beyond that, you find you, you're, you quickly get tired. And that's about that transition point. For me, I always say it's about 5.5 on the treadmill. Um, and so that's, you know, I found an image of 5.5. <laughs> but, but if I go faster than 5.5, I find there's a noted difference in my fatigue level uh, when I'm doing something for like an hour on a treadmill. So there you go. All right. So assuming, yeah, I'm going to 5.2. By the way, this is not, 5.5 is not any, uh, not in anywhere the same scale as what we're talking about here this is the you know I, I don't know miles per hour or something whatever the <laughs> the ones that my gym give me um but uh but yeah but i can assume that my 4.7 kilocalories per minute energy expenditure is somewhere near this pace uh when i'm on that machine all right so of course we get heavier and heavier there's going to be work you know even athletic activities uh that yeah 10 10 kilocalories a minute and if you look in the textbook, there's a few more descriptors in there of like common work activities and about what the metabolic rate, uh, the required rate are. Um, but again, these are all ones where you know we're going to need anaerobic metabolism to be able to produce at that level of output. And so you can count on sore and fatigued workers. And maybe you need to work in things like additional break time or job rotation, for example. There we go. Okay, so that's our respiratory system. Now let's do circulatory. Uh, and so first thing we talk about is blood. Uh, and blood is an organ. It is, you know, um, comprised of uh, a lot of liquid. So it's weird to think of as an organ. Um, but uh, think of the cells within suspended in the plasma. The plasma is the liquid. Uh, and there are, there are more elements than this, but the main elements we're interested in uh, as far as cells are the red blood cells. These are the ones that have hemoglobin, which binds to the oxygen molecules, the O2 molecules. And that is the carrier of oxygen from the lungs to the heart and then from the heart to the extremities. Um, and so, yep, we need our red blood cells. And when they're red, that's again, because the hemoglobin has bound, is, is, bind, is bound or binded to, to, um, to um, there's a bond between, <laughs> between the hemoglobin and the oxygen uh, uh, molecules. Um, and I don't know that it, it's not hemoglobin, but another uh, uh, molecule in red blood cells that will bind to the CO2, the carbon dioxide, take it back to the lungs where it's then unloaded for exhalation. Uh, the white cells, these are our, our you know, immune system. They fight intruders and platelets help for blood clots. Um, that's all you're gonna hear about blood. Uh, for the most part, red cells being the oxygen carriers are of interest when we're talking about aerobic or anaerobic processes here. Uh, plasma is mostly water. Uh, and about 8% of the adult uh, uh, body weight is blood. Remember, 40% are muscles, 8% is blood. So we got about, well, what are we at, 48%? <laughs> well, we'll have to talk about skeletons later. Uh, uh, but yes, yeah, so we have you know, about this quantity of blood. Interesting to note, 5.2 liters of blood. And very commonly, when blood donation occurs, it's given in units of liters. Uh, so there can be um, you know, cases, well, at least I've seen them in units of liters. I want to think so. Maybe, maybe I'm sure they're offered in less than offered, but I'm sure they're packaged in, in quantities less than that. Um, but in any case, yes, um, you know, 
comparing, you know, when there's a blood, a need for uh, a donor blood, you know, either because someone has bled and needs to maintain a certain volume in order for to have effective circulation or for other reasons, you know, that'll, that'll put it in perspective. All right. Okay. Uh, right. The heart is our pump. Now the heart has four chambers. And if you think about, the, I, I'm going to oversimplify a little bit, but think about um, uh, the right side chambers are responsible for delivering blood to the lungs. Um, well, there's actually, I'm going to go through all the, uh, the whole cycle here, but one side sends blood to the lungs and that blood will ar arrive deoxygenated with carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide will exchange at the lung barrier and oxygen will 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 re be you know I guess rebound to 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 the hemoglobin of the red cells. Then that blood goes back to the heart and it goes into the power chamber. Uh, and the ventricles are the pumps. The ventricles send to send the blood to the lungs and send the blood into the extremities. Um, and the atria receive them. There's a one way valve here. Uh, um, all right. So sorry, I maybe spoke ahead of myself here, but. Um, important notes here are the atria, that's where the blood is, arrives, it's deoxygenated, well, not, I'm sorry, that's where the blood arrives, arrives, whether it's oxygenated or deoxygenated, then it goes down into the pump structure, those are the ventricles, either goes to the lungs or to the body extremities. So, okay, so here's the cycle. All right, so uh, if you can see my image here, um, you know, oxygenated blood is redder, than deoxygenated blood. Um, this is one of the ways, by the way, that um, wearable pulse plethysmography devices work for determining heart rate. So if you have a, an eye watch, for, for example, or another wearable that has an optical sensor that detects, um, that detects your heart rate, uh, what it's looking for is a change in, well, it's really looking for the movement of anything in a, in, you, know, you know, here. But the difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood shows different reflectiveness by the uh, by the light, the optical sensor that's used, and so then that's the determination of a of a heartbeat is the blood flowing through that that region. I guess in PPG there's there's a volume consideration too, so maybe I'm getting off on a little bit, but in any case, there you go. So your your blood will look redder when there's oxygen in it. Uh, and so the, let's say we're at the end of our cycle, we have the deoxygenated blood, meaning the blood got to our extremities, it dropped off its oxygen, it collected the carbon dioxide, which is a byproduct of metabolism at the tissue there. And it's now delivering the carbon dioxide back to, you know, to, to be, it basically collects via all of the, the, the veins and it returns to the heart. It enters the right atrium. So here's step one, I suppose, in the, uh, in the recycling of blood. Um, so it then uh, goes from the atrium, that's the collecting uh, chamber, to the ventricle. The ventricle then, when there is a ventricular contraction, um, then the right ventricle sends blood to the lungs. The left ventricle sends blood to the extremities. Um, but the right uh, ventricle sends that blood, goes to the lungs, the pulmonary artery uh, takes us to the lungs, pulmonary, pul you know, that, that's like the root for, for lungs. Um, and uh, then there's the gas exchange and the gas comes back and collect, or the blood comes back, is collected in the left atrium. Uh, that's oxygenated blood. It's ready to go. It's ready to be delivered. It goes into the left ventricle. And again, when there's a ventricular contraction, that blood goes to the tissues and the extremities. Repeat, repeat, repeat. So each heartbeat, there are there is this amount of, um, of cycle. There we go. Okay, so the tubes by which the blood travels to our extremities are also part of the circulatory system, the heart being the, you know, the main pump, the main, the main activator, but uh, how do we get blood to our brain, to our fingers, uh, to our toes? Um, so the oxygenated blood or, yeah, I'm sorry, it could be deoxygenated because it could be going to the lungs or it could be going to the body, um, but the uh, going away from the heart arteries. So if you say the pulmonary artery, I'm going to the lungs. If you say, you know, there are several other 
arteries that go up and down to different body sections. I know the carotid artery right here is interesting because I have personally witnessed a couple of carotid end arterectomies, which involve, um, there are two carotid arteries and, uh, or are there? Maybe, I forget, but I think there are two. Maybe there's only one, but in any case, it involves uh, 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 you know, shutting off access to that artery and therefore shutting off the main supplier of blood and therefore oxygen to the brain and cleaning it out. And so the procedures I've seen usually involve some sort of bypass so that there's still blood going to the brain, but uh, it's a pretty intense procedure. So I've, I've seen a couple of, I kind of specialized in that in, in, in my PhD work. I watched a couple of them. But yeah, if that thing isn't providing blood to the brain, you're not getting oxygen to the brain and that's not gonna help you be alive. <laughs> All right, so arteries, they, they're doing that work. Um, the arteries then, you know, become uh, uh, smaller channels and things we call arterioles. Those branch into capillaries. The capillaries are the, are the, uh, you know, the smallest side streets that take the blood cells to the tissue. And that's where the tissue, uh, you know, there's an oxygen exchange from the hemoglobin there. Um, and then we've got that deoxygenated blood cell. Uh, maybe it's also absorbed carbon dioxide uh, from the byproduct of the metabolism at those cells. Uh, and so it's coming back via those same capillaries uh, and then they merge into venules. The venules uh, uh, go to veins and then we have some major you know, sewage lines back into the, into the heart, the superior up, inferior below vena cava. Uh, uh, those two are the main um, uh, channels by which blood you know, comes back to the heart, to the right atrium, right? The deoxygenated blood from, you know, from, from that cycle and then uh, comes back to the heart. All right, blood pressure. Um, something I have to think about <laughs> uh, is, uh, is also part of getting blood to the extremities. So for example, if I have a weak heartbeat, uh, you have to think about how far that heart, that, that blood will be pumped. Part of that is the pressure that's produced by the diameter of the vessels, right? So you're, you're shoving blood through a tube. If that tube is narrower, you're going to have a higher pressure. You're going to have more velocity, you know, in that in that fluid. Um, and so then that's you know the reason why we don't want blood pressures too high is not only because we can have damage, you know, to our vessels uh, because of the pressure, but also because maybe the you know the arrival of blood at the extremities is like a fire hose as opposed to maybe a I don't know a sprinkler. <laughs> um, no. So in any case, that you know that that's um, uh, the 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 pressure by which blood is delivered to the extremities has to be considered in this system as well. So yeah, we call this vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Um, these are things that you know, for example, when your nose is stuffed, you know, a lot of times that is a case of vasoconstriction. I think, um, which might be in relation to pollen in the air, which is in the air right now. Um, and so, you know, that's to some extent, the stuffiness is a swelling, which is also related to um, the, uh, uh, you know, kind of constriction of, 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 um, of respiratory circulation in terms of the fluid in the blood uh, in the nasal passage. When we talk about blood pressure, we usually have two numbers and those represent the pressure during systole, uh, which is systolic pressure. Systole is <clears throat> the power stroke, the ventricular contraction. So when the heart says, I'm shoving all the blood to the extremities, at that maximum peak there, that's our systolic pressure. And diastolic pressure is the diastole is between those compressive moments. So it's sort of like when the fluid in the veins are, is at rest, what's the resting pressure there? Uh, and it's usually expressed with both of those numbers. And I put in extreme quotes normal because uh, uh, this has never been uh, normal for me. I probably, probably don't have normal blood pressure. Um, mine's higher than 110 over 70, but um, that is what's considered as, as across the general population, a, a nice mean target. 
it's very much different person to person. I will definitely say that working with a doctor to manage your blood pressure is a good thing, but 110 is not going to be the target for everybody. Uh, if you're curious about how you know blood pressure readings work, basically you go to the doctor, they do the cuff method. What they're doing is they're pumping until you have more pressure in the cuff than is able to be sustained by the uh, by that by that that vessel, that channel, that blood channel, uh, in order to you know send blood past that. And so you're finding essentially the point at which systolic pressure the pressure in the cuff is greater than the systolic pressure, can't get the blood through. Uh, and then from there, you reduce until you can hear a clear blood flow, meaning there's, there's no further restriction uh, uh, by the level of pressure uh, you know, between beats. And then that's your diastolic pressure. So that's how that you know, works when people take your pressure with a stethoscope, stethoscope and a blood pressure cuff. So again, here's kind of characteristic ranges, according to the American Heart Association. Every human is different. Every human has different safe ranges. I'm not a medical doctor, but here you go. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So just like what we talked about, um, how much oxygen is absorbed per unit time as an indicator of you know metabolic capacity, uh, we can also talk about how much blood can reach their extremities per unit time. Uh, and so Q is the metric we use. This is called the uh, the stroke. What is it? Yeah, like it's just it's just a metric volume of blood pumped to the body per heartbeat, and it is the stroke volume. Uh, sorry, it's not per heartbeat. It's per it's per unit time. So it's it's equivalent to the stroke volume one compression of the ventricle. How much volume of blood is delivered to the extremities per beat, and how many beats are there per minute? Uh, so at rest, uh, uh, you, you know, people are roughly five liters per minute of delivered blood to the extremities. Uh, once we start working hard, our heart rate goes up, and uh, you know, so now we're we're going all the way up to potentially 25 liters per minute. Most of that is in the increased rate, but it isn't five times faster. So for example, a lot of times resting heart rate, something around 75 beats per minute, maybe 70, maybe lower, maybe higher. Um, but if you think about going, if, if, if each uh, 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 beat of the heart had a uniform volume, then this would mean essentially five times, go from five to 25, you'd have five times as, as fast a heartbeat and five times 75 being what, two, the heck? I can't do it. <laughs> uh, 375, yeah. 375 per minute, no, that's, that's, that's faster than a human heart works. So there is a larger volume uh, in, in each beat. I just don't know exactly the relationship as far as how the heart expands in volume per compression, per, per, per beat. All right, well, Q, this index also affected by the age, our age, sex, our fitness, uh, emotional content. So emotion affects vasoconstriction, vasodilation. Uh, and then this can impact how our, 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 our oxygenation reaches our extremities. Um, posture is an interesting thing because blood is a fluid and it cools. And therefore, you know, it takes more energy to pump up against uh, gravity than it does to let blood you know, work with gravity. So interesting. All right. Uh, if you talk about, you know, Q as blood flow per unit time, again, uh, we can then take the percentile of that blood flow and talk about how the human body um, uh, diverts blood to different parts of the body based on the type of activity. So you note, you know, if we're uh, uh, hanging out and in a resting sort of context here, uh, then our muscles are not taking a whole lot of our blood. Our brain is taking, you know, the most, at least compared to these other ones, our brain's in the best state for, you know, receiving blood to be processing things like class. Uh, if I am doing moderate or heavy work and maybe moderate work in a hot environment, that's a key here that this is also much hotter environment, 38 degrees Celsius, um, your, your, your blood is going to deliver 
uh, it's going to go to different regions based on your your needs as far as uh, metabolic output. So do our skeletal muscles need a lot of blood, right? Like here, um, or for example, is it hot? And therefore I need to, uh, you know, send more blood to my skin because that's an effective uh, uh, heat transfer, okay? So in order for your body to control its internal temperature, one of the ways it lets off heat is by having greater blood flow to the skin. So vasodilating near the skin surface, greater heat exchange there. All right. But yes, yeah, so we have different sorts of, you know, your brain, your, your brain works with the heart and, and the circulatory system to divert the blood to different regions based on the needs. Uh, this is also a good, you know, kind of indicator here. Look at this, our digestive system. So, you know, if you've ever, you know, your parents would tell you don't uh, eat lunch and then go swimming immediately. And part of that is because, you know, to digest food, you need blood going to your guts. Uh, but if you're also doing heavy work like swimming uh, and you don't have that blood going to your guts, it's instead going to your muscles, this is where you can get some, you know, indigestion cramp sorts of problems. All right. Okay, so heart rate, this is something very commonly measured, very frankly, easily measured. Uh, and a, a nice thing to keep track of when you're saying, when you're looking at how hard are my workers, you know, uh, performing work, are they getting into risky situations, et cetera. Um, so heart rate accelerating has a lot to do with keeping up with the gas exchange rate at the tissues and at the lungs. Uh, and, uh, and this is done by response to uh, carbon dioxide in the blood. So carbon dioxide is a waste product of aerobic metabolism. And in, it's going to have a percentage in the blood, but it's being removed each time that blood cycles through the lungs and there's a gas exchange at the lungs. So the sensing of the carotid artery, which is again, the one that goes to the brain right here, is sensing how much carbon dioxide is in the blood and essentially changing the heart, like it's a direct feedback loop with the heart rate. So I have these pictures here because if you want to demonstrate this, you know, the, if you want to see for yourself, hold your breath, which is you're going to have an accumulation of carbon dioxide if you stop breathing. And you don't have to hold your breath for a long time. And if you're feeling your pulse, which you can get right here at the carotid artery, uh, you will probably feel your heart rate increase. And that is your heart trying to pick up the pace of circulation in order to pick up the, the number of cycles of respiration uh, of, of gas exchange at the lungs. So give it a shot. All right, <laughs> catch your breath. Uh, so typically, uh, you know, really well conditioned athletes tend to have lower heart rates, mostly because you think of the power of each stroke. Uh, it's a more efficient machine. You know, it's, uh, you, there's more blood circulated. The circulatory system is typically uh, 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 you know in better um, shape for 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 conveying blood to the tissues. It's you know when we're when we're athletically active, your body is constantly rebuilding and and uh, and healing. Um, so you know, but sixty to eighty beats per minute at rest for for your average human, that's very normal. Um, mine's at about seventy usually. Uh, if it's less than sixty, they call this bradycardia. That means too slow, uh, but it's not that serious. It's just slower than average, slower than normal. Um, I work with somebody who is a very healthy uh, uh, engineer uh, woman uh, who has a resting heart rate of 52. And I've seen it with my eyes. Uh, and so, but she otherwise, you know, not unusually athletic, just this is going to be the characteristic with some people. Um, tachycardia is above 100. But again, there are cases where that might be perfectly normal especially, so these are for adults also, and you may notice, you know, smaller people, children, infants have a naturally much higher heart rates. Um, and so that, that has a lot to do with, you know, their hearts are conditioned to getting blood to the extremities of that size and being of a small size, the heart itself. So, all right, uh, Lance Armstrong, you know, not that uh, uh, he is the, the most revered these days, but does have an impressively low 
uh, uh, heart rate, resting heart rate of 32 beats per minute. And again, this is just indicative of how well tuned his circulatory and cardiac system, you know, his cardiac muscle is. All right, the maximum heart rate that somebody achieves is very much linearly related to our age as terms of how much we might be at risk of, you know, a serious cardiac or, you know, like a stroke event, like an injury. Uh, and so they have a formula, and this comes from a scientist named Cooper, uh, who basically, this is the original unaltered formula. There's going to be some alterations I'll talk about in a minute, but says, you know, the, the safe heart rate at, at somebody's maximum level of activity, uh, the absolute maximum of anybody should be 220 beats per minute. So again, that's making, you know, it's simplifying across all of humanity, but that's, that's where we, we set it. And then we subtract our age in years and you get to your heart rate when you're exercising or when you're working hard, doing hard work, for example, it should not exceed this, th this uh, number of beats per minute. You know, so if you are 40 years old, like some people, um, uh, your maximum heart rate would be 220 minus 40 equals 108. And you can see 180 uh, for a 40 year old uh, is in the very vigorous exercise range. Um, and, you know, we don't, I, I don't know, that this, this is exactly showing what the Cooper Harper, what the Cooper formula shows us. Um, but uh, you can see that, yes, with age, we want to see our target heart rate ranges decrease. And being in the red range is not good. Even if you are really in good shape and exercising, it's it generally you wanna be you know, um, in a safer range, at least for cardiac health. All right, so medical stress test, this is where we would use that sort of equation, 220 minus age, the absolute maximum that your heart rate should be at. This is not a reasonable standard if you're saying what is the maximum that's reasonable for you at work. So this isn't, you know, you shouldn't be going to work and being expected to do everything you possibly can physically produce every day. <laughs> so we have a modified uh, version. We say 75% of what you can maximally produce. Let's call that the acceptable, at least this isn't a law, there's no rule for this. This is a human factors rule of thumb to keep our workers happy capable of, of performing over a long period of time, use 75% of their uh, Cooper maximum, you know, the original Cooper formula, 75% of that, and say that is our target as far as we, we don't want our workers to have heart rates that exceed this at any point during their work, okay? So if, if the level of activity that we're requiring of them brings their heart rate at any time above this equation, a heart rate max, 75% times 220 minus their age, then that is, that's beyond our design requirement, our design goal here. We, we want to change the nature of the work somehow. We want to add additional people uh, so that, you know, this heart rate, it doesn't exceed that maximum value. And that's for, you know, it's, it's risk of heart attack. It's also uh, indicative of um, other health problems that will result if, if, if your heart rate is, is indi indicating that level of high work. Okay, so this is about, oops, this is about maximum heart rate. So imagine we gave our workers, you know, heart rate wearables, so, you know, Apple Watch or whatever, and we can track their heart rate now. And we're doing that because we wanna make sure nobody gets into a dangerous situation. We could set up, we being the company, for example, could set up alarms that say, if any of our workers ever, you know, if their heart rate ever ever is greater than this, uh, that's a problem. We want to be alerted. Therefore, we can go and intervene and change something about the nature of the work. But there's a different thing between saying, don't ever let it go above this. And what are you dealing with over the course of the entire day? So in terms of the average heart rate that might be reasonable over an eight hour shift, we have a different equation. Now, this one has to take into account somebody's resting heart rate. So everybody has a different resting heart rate. Um, so again, this is maximum heart rate doesn't matter about what your resting heart rate is. Okay, so, so, so it's just an age defined and then we've got a safety factor. Uh, but here we got to know, you know, are you a 52 beats per minute at rest or are you 75 beats per minute at rest or what? Um, and then we can know what your max is, okay? 
because your max is still just like we showed in the previous slide. Um, and we find the difference between the maximum, and that's again using that same 220 minus your age, that's what HR max is in this case, the absolute medical testing max. And we find the difference from that and your resting heart rate, we determine what is a 40% increase from your resting heart rate to, you know, towards the, the, the maximum value. And we say, okay, we can go 40% above our resting heart rate. That should be the average, the maximum allowable average as measured over eight hour shift. Okay. So again, I don't have a safety factor here because this is the medical maximum in this case. So here's our example. We have a 55 year old male and the heart, heart rate at rest is 70 beats per minute. I then say my heart rate at rest 70 plus and 220 minus 55 is my medical test limit. Uh, so let's see, what is that 165? And then I subtract from that the resting heart rate. So I get 95 and I multiply that by 40%. So I get 38. And so then this ends up being my resting heart rate 70 plus 38. And now I know I don't, I don't want it. So if I have somebody I, I capture their heart rate over an entire eight hour shift. I do the mean of that entire shift end to end. And I better not see that it's over 108 beats per minute. If I do, that means they're working too hard. I should, I should modify something about the job. I should give them a little bit you know, more rest time, find a different tool, add additional people, et cetera. As you're going from eight hours to 12 hours, you wanna be you know, even a little more um, um, you know, careful with the, uh, with the human here. So we'll reduce it to 35%. I'll only ask you about eight hour or 12 hour shifts, but consider, you know, you could have cases of people doing 24 hour shifts. That's not unheard of, right? It's in some fields. Um, and so, yeah, you might, you might end up reducing that further being care more and more careful. For this case, you know, for this class, just know that eight hour shift, 40%, if you're going greater than eight hour shifts, such as 12 hours, go to 35%. If we were gonna go beyond that, it would be some number less that's reasonable. Um, but yeah, so in the same case, if we have the same worker uh, going for 50, uh, for 12 hour shift, uh, we don't wanna see that heart rate exceed 103 beats per minute. Okay, um, so uh, people who are more physically fit uh, have a more effective aerobic metabolism process uh, they have again, you know, uh, uh, more more efficient gas exchange in the lungs. You know, better distribution of of nutrients and oxygen to the extremities, uh, and so you can see that you know with time, uh, the uh, uh, you know the ability to sustain certain uh, outputs is, is is higher for training people. So yes, there we go. Uh, after we're done working, and we stop, we we sit down. We might still be out of breath working on our oxygen debt because of the lactic acid buildup from anaerobic uh, uh, um, metabolism. Our heart rate will also, you know, gradually slow down. Uh, it won't immediately, you know, return to a resting state. Uh, and the, you know, this has a lot to do with it, you know, kind of adjusting uh, vasoconstriction, vasodilation as part of this as well. As well, still need to deliver oxygen to the tissues for any. Um, oxygen debt that's there, um, but the heart rate slows. Typically, uh, uh, you know, for a healthy adult, uh, it's about 10 beats per minute slower after three minutes, you know, kind of follows this sort of a pattern here. Um, and for heavier work, you have a faster deceleration of the heart rate. Okay, there we go. Thanks, that's the end of 13.2.